Hey everyone, today I'm going to walk you through all of the bosses and trash in Ice Crown Citadel from the tank perspective. The goal of this video is just to get you ready to tank ICC for the first time, and I won't spend much time discussing mechanics that aren't important for tanks. I'll have commentary videos out for some of the more difficult bosses in the future where I'll go into more detail and advanced strats. This raid has both a normal and heroic difficulty, and I'll mention any differences as we go along. The difficulty level only affects bosses, trash will always be the same. As you enter ICC, you'll see a big room that has various NPCs. You can explore around here and see what all they have. At the entrance to the next room, you'll see a couple mobs called the Damned. And just inside that room, there will be a patrol with a couple more. More of these mobs will occasionally spawn near the entrance and run towards the NPCs. They don't do too much damage, but they'll occasionally cast Bone Flurry, which gives them 100% increased attack speed. You can interrupt this with stuns or just tank through it. It isn't too dangerous. They will also explode when they die, dealing pretty big damage to any melee nearby, so just tell your melee to be careful when these get low. If a few explode at the same time, some melee will probably die. Have a rogue scout ahead for traps. There will be two in each room. These will be circles on the ground that only rogues can see and disarm, and they have to get pretty close to see them. If one of these traps is activated, a giant skeleton that's normally frozen on the left or right side of the room will activate and start patrolling. These skeletons are not tauntable and they cleave, so face them away from the raid. They'll also cast Disrupting Shout that will interrupt anyone casting when the cast finishes. It's of course important that your healers don't get hit by this or you won't be getting any heals. Throughout this room and the next room, you'll see Servants of the Throne and Nerubar Broodkeepers. Servants of the Throne have a frontal line attack, just face these away from the raid. They can also be interrupted and stunned. The Broodkeepers will occasionally heal, this should be interrupted, and they're also stunnable. The Broodkeepers are pretty annoying to move since they just cast Crypt Scarabs from range, so try to stack mobs on top of them and have a DK grip in the other one if there are two in the pack. Early on you'll probably want to kill all of the trash for rep and BOEs, but the trash will not pull when Marigar is pulled, so you'll likely be skipping as much trash as you can pretty quickly. Now for the first boss, Lord Marigar. I recommend one tank for 10 man and two for 25 man, but if tanks are dying, you can add an additional tank. It may be solo tankable on 25 man in the future too. The main mechanic for tanks here is Bone Slice, a frontal cleave that splits damage amongst the main tank and up to two nearby players on 25 man and one on 10 man. For about 8 seconds after the fight starts and 8 seconds after Bone Storm ends, you'll have a grace period where Marigar will not cast Bone Slice. This gives you some time to get him in position without any raid members randomly getting cleaved. Marigar will occasionally cast Bone Spike Graveyard that will stun a random player until the Bone Spike is killed by the raid. You don't need to worry about killing these yourself, but just pay attention to when healers get picked because you may need to use a defensive. Marigar will also shoot out a line of fire occasionally. If this goes on you, just sidestep out of it. If you have someone else tanking with you, just figure out ahead of time which way you guys are going to go so you stay together to split Bone Slice. Marigar will also occasionally cast Bone Storm, during which time he will constantly whirlwind and move around the room. Just move off to the side to try to bait him away from others and throw out any heals or CDs you can to help other people survive. He'll also put Blue Fire on the ground in this phase too, but it will move out in four directions. Just get out of this. Keep an eye on the Bone Storm timer and be ready to pick him up as soon as it ends. You'll just keep repeating the normal phase and Bone Storm phase until he dies. Now run up the ramp on the left or right side and you'll be in Lady Death Whisper's room. You'll see a bunch of mobs in the middle, have a pally pull these together with bubble, and then go in and sap her and pump AoE threat. You can get a paints up as you're running in for safety. Most of the pack will be caster mobs spamming Shadow Bolt, Chaos Bolt, and a heal. All of these are interruptible, so anyone that can interrupt should. The Death Speaker Zealots cleave, so face these away from the raid. Off on either side of the room are Death Speaker High Priests. You can single pull these or pull them both at the same time. They'll put a debuff called Dark Reckoning on random raid members, and those people need to move away from the raid. If the debuff gets put on you, just make sure you and the melee are both at max melee range and it shouldn't hit them. It will deal damage and heal the Death Speaker if others get hit by it. The next boss is Lady Death Whisper. You can use 1-2 to two tanks for her on 10 man and 2-3 to three tanks on 25 man. On normal mode she is tauntable and has no adds in phase 2, while on heroic she is not tauntable and has adds in phase 2. 
So extra tanks aren't needed for normal. In phase one, Death Whisper will not be tankable. She'll just stand still casting until her mana shield is broken. The raid just needs to damage the shield until she runs out of mana to start phase two. Your main job as a tank in this phase is to pick up adds. They'll spawn three at a time from alternating sides on 10 man and three from each side and one from the entrance on 25 man. Bolt Fanatics are melee mobs that cleave, so face these away. They'll also cast Vampiric Might, which increases their damage and causes their attacks to heal them. This can be purged off. Bolt Adherents are casters that will cast a Bolt, a Slow, and a Curse that increases the cooldown of any ability used by 15 seconds. So just stop doing anything but auto-attacking until the curse is off of you. They'll also put up an Absorb Shield, which makes them uninterruptible until the shield is removed. Adds will occasionally cast Dark Martyrdom, which does AoE damage around them and causes them to resurrect shortly after as a skeleton. Reanimated Fanatics will take 99% reduced physical damage, and Reanimated Adherents will take 99% reduced magic damage. Death Whisper may also cast Dark Transformation on a Cult Fanatic, which will turn it into a big zombie called a Deformed Fanatic. This will increase its damage by 100%. It's usually best to just kite this, but you can phase tank it with defensives also. Try to group adds near Death Whisper for cleave. Phase 2 will begin once Death Whisper's mana has been depleted. You should time this around add spawns so that you can push when there are no adds alive. On normal, she is tauntable, but on heroic, she is not. She'll frequently apply a 20% reduced threat generated debuff on the main tank. So try to pump as much threat as you can early, and hunters and rogues should trix and MD the MT also. Prop values can also bubble this off, so you can wait till it hits 5 stacks and completely clear your threat reduction for a while until it stacks back up again. If Death Whisper won't die by the time Threat is going to be an issue for your DPS, you'll need another tank threading her so they can pick it up once the MT can no longer do Threat. Death Whisper will constantly try to cast high damage frostbolts that are interruptible. It's normally important to interrupt these because the damage they do is very high. However, there was an alternate strat people discovered on PTR where they would have their tank wear frost resist gear, put Curse of Tongues on the boss, and never enter up the frost bolts, preventing Death Whisper from applying the threat reduction debuff to the tank. I think this will get fixed when it goes live, but that's potentially something you could try too. Pink Ghosts will frequently spawn around the room, one on 10 man and three on 25 man, and you'll want to keep an eye on these so you can move Death Whisper away from them. This way your melee can continue to DPS while staying safe from the ghosts. If the ghosts reach a player, they'll do a big AoE to the raid on heroic, but just damage the person they hit on normal. Some adds will continue to spawn this phase on heroic, one from the entrance on 10 man and three from an alternating side on 25 man. So one of the tanks will need to pick these up. It's easiest to have three tanks for this on 25 man, so one can be on adds full time and the other two can be on the boss full time. She'll also continue to mind control and death and decay during phase two, so CC anyone you can and move the boss away from death and decay. Once you've killed Death Whisper, run back to the entrance of the room and take the teleporter. It will be a bit quicker than the elevator. Once you're up top, you'll see Horde and Alliance mobs fighting each other. Just group these up, AoE and interrupt. Get death grips on any far away mobs. Horde will go right and Alliance will go left to get to their ship. Just before you get to your ship, a Spire Frostworm will land on you. It will cleave, so just face away from the raid. Hop on your ship and talk to the NPC to the left of Sourfang or Muradin to get a rocket pack. Make sure you equip this. It will allow you to jump between the two ships. You can also add this macro to your rotational abilities. The rocket pack does AoE damage and is off GCD, so this just gives you a ton of free AoE damage. Make sure you have a separate keybind with just the regular rocket pack so you can jump between ships. Talk to Sourfang or Muradin to start the fight, but it won't actually begin for about 45 seconds after you talk to them. You'll want two tanks for this fight. One tank will be in charge of picking up adds coming out of a portal in the middle of your own ship. The sergeants are the only mobs that really do anything, but even they don't do too much. They'll have a mortal strike, a blade storm, and a attack speed buff. Just stand still and AoE threat everything that comes out of the portal. There will be missiles constantly hitting your ship throughout the fight. These will be circular orange patterns on the ground. Just move out of them if this targets you. They will do some damage and knock you back if they hit you. If you're assigned to go to the other ship, you'll wait until a mage spawns on the enemy ship. This mage will freeze your cannons, causing all your DPS to have to go over to the enemy ship to kill it. Your job will be to get there first and pick up Sourfang if you're Alliance or Muradin if you're Horde. 
Just tank him next to the edge of the boat so healers can easily reach you. You'll gain a stacking buff that makes him do more damage the longer he's in combat. Your raid will rocket pack back over to your ship once the mage is dead. After all of your raid members have left, you can also rocket pack back. Sourfang or Muradin will then leave combat and reset their stacks. You'll just keep repeating this over and over until your cannons have destroyed the other ship. You can hop off the ship and talk to Muradin or Sourfang to start the RP for the next boss, Deathbringer Sourfang. If you're Horde, there's going to be like a minute and 40 seconds of RP every time you pull this boss, but hopefully they'll change this. This is a 2 tank fight on both 10 and 25 man. Once the RP is started, you'll see Sourfang emerge from the Citadel. Just stand in front of him and do all your pre-pull stuff right before he activates. You should have a timer for this either from DBM or a week or a pack. Sourfang will gain blood power every time he deals damage with an ability or his blood beast adds deal damage. He will gain 1% damage for every point of blood power he has, so keep an eye on this. He'll do more damage to you at higher blood power, so that's when you want to use your defensive CDs. When he reaches 100 blood power, he will cast Mark of the Fallen Champion, a permanent debuff on a random raid member, and then his blood power will reset to zero. So this whole fight, his damage done will be fluctuating. If someone with Mark of the Fallen Champion dies, they will also heal Sourfang. Mark of the Fallen Champion is the soft enrage. Eventually, you'll have too many of them and your healers won't be able to keep up. You'll be tank swapping on this fight constantly when Sourfang casts Rune of Blood on the other tank. His debuff will last 20 seconds and cause the tank to take additional damage, heal Sourfang, and give him blood power when Sourfang lands a melee attack on them. It's important to taunt instantly so he doesn't land any melees on a tank affected by Rune of Blood. I also recommend being taunt hit capped. The various taunt glyphs each tank has that add 8% chance to hit are great. Seraphang also will not cast Rune of Blood while a DK has anti-magic shell up, so you can delay his Rune of Blood cast and reduce the amount of tank swaps this way. This is particularly useful for desyncing his Rune of Blood and Blood Beast timers, so tanks can do various things to help with Blood Beast without having to worry about taunting Seraphang at the exact same time. He'll summon Blood Beast every 40 seconds. It'll be 2 on 10 man and 5 on 25 man. It's really important that these don't hit anyone because they'll both give him a big spike in blood power and potentially kill people they hit too. Prop High should hodge one each spawn by picking up the improved Hammer of Justice talent. Prop Warriors can Concussion Blow and Shockwave. Just make sure you don't Shockwave too early and DR a longer stun. The Blood Beasts take a couple seconds to activate once they spawn, so you should be quick with your stuns, but it doesn't need to be instant. Assign stuns ahead of time to maximize coverage and keep things consistent. Generally, all of the melee DPS will focus down a mob with a 6 second stun on them, so they can DPS hard without fear of ripping aggro. Feral Druids can bash, and Blood DKs can change the vice too. The Blood Beasts take reduced AoE damage, but some tank cleaves will do full damage, so be really careful when using cleave abilities around Blood Beasts, especially when they've just spawned. If a Blood Beast starts attacking you, Sarfang is going to get a lot of blood power, so do everything you can to avoid this. You should also keep an eye on a Blood Beast that get out towards ranged, as you can potentially taunt one from far away to save someone, and DPS should have enough time to kill it before it reaches you. He'll cast Blood Boil periodically on random raid members. Prop Pies can look to bop this off of ideally a caster or a non-pally healer to reduce blood power gain. At 30%, Sourfang will gain Frenzy, increasing his attack speed by 30%. Try to use defensive CDs as much as you can once he's frenzied, especially when he has more than 50 blood power. Now that you've killed Sourfang, you can enter the Citadel. When you first enter, you'll see some blue fire shooting out of the walls. This will shoot for a bit, then stop, then resume over and over. As a tank, you can kind of just pop defensives or bubble and rocket boot through the whole thing. Once you get through all of it, enter the main room of the citadel and the teleport will open. So you can just blaze through it and your raid can wait by the Sour Fang teleporter to safely skip all of the fire. In this main room, you'll see two Valkyr flying around. You can try to skip them by hugging the walls and being careful, but someone always pulls them, so I just plan to grab them when they're nearby. Have the whole raid stack on the Valkyr. They'll periodically summon adds that spawn on players, so if everyone's already grouped up, they can easily be AoE'd down. The Plague Wing will be off to your left, the Blood Wing will be straight ahead, and the Frost Wing will be off to your right. 
In front of the Plague Wing, you'll fight two Blighted Abominations. These have a cleave, so face them away from the raid. They'll also drop a cloud on the ground that deals damage to anyone who stands in it, but I found this to be negligible and don't bother moving out of it. Inside the first room, there's a patrol of geists and a pack of plague scientists and pulsating horrors. If you tank the A-bombs close to the door, these will eventually aggro and you'll be fighting all of them at once. I always just pull all of this stuff at once and AoE it down, but if you're having any issues with that, you can pull them separately. The geists don't really do anything. The plague scientists buff a mob's damage by 100% with plague stream, which is interruptible, and turn players into oozes, making them unable to attack or cast spells, but this can be cleansed. Pulsating horrors will start a self-destruct cast when they get low HP, which will one-shot most people if the cast goes off. You can either burn them down or run away, but I would just burn them down as long as you're in a group where people will actually focus down skull. Proceed up the stairs and you'll see a decaying colossus. All he does is an AoE knockback occasionally. There will be a dog patrolling on both the left and right hallways, so just be careful not to pull them while you're grabbing the decaying colossus. In this hallway are more traps, so send your rogues ahead to disarm them. If someone triggers one, a bunch of geists will attack you and you'll just need to AoE them down. Precious is a mini boss that patrols the right side of the hallway. Like Gluth and Nax Ramish, she will cast Decimate, which will set the whole raid's HP to 15%. She'll also cast Mortal Wound, a stacking 10% healing reduction debuff on the tank. You can tank swap this at about 6 stacks for safety. She'll also summon a bunch of zombies, just AoE these down quickly. They'll apply an increased physical damage taken debuff every time they hit you. Down the left side of the hallway, you'll run into another mini boss, Stinky. He has all the same abilities as Precious, except he does pulsing raid damage every few seconds instead of summoning zombies. Down the left part of the hallway, you'll find our next boss, Fester Gut. You'll want 1 to 2 tanks for this on 10 and 25 man. It really depends on your kill time and how many gastric bloats you get onto DPS, whether you'll want 1 or 2 tanks. I recommend 2 tanks early on until you have a good understanding of the fight and your DPS is higher before making the jump to 1 tank. On 25 man, it will be quite a bit harder to 1 tank, so you'll likely want to wait till your raid is pretty geared before you try it. One of the main mechanics you'll be dealing with as a tank is Gastric Bloat, dealing about 12k resistible plague damage on 10 man and 15k on 25 man. Plague damage is both nature and shadow school, and your resist chance is based off your lower resist of the two. Gastric Bloat will also apply a stacking debuff that increases your damage done by 10% per stack. This is cast about every 12 seconds, and the debuff lasts for 1 minute and 40 seconds. If a player reaches 10 stacks, they'll explode and wipe the raid. So it's important never to reach 10 stacks. Prop values can bubble the debuff off when it gets to 9 if you're solo tanking, and the debuff can also be removed with Divine Intervention. Since this is a damage buff, we'd like to get it on as many DPS as possible. There are several options for this, but I'll name a few. You can have a Feral Druid in full cat gear tank the boss for 4-5 to five stacks at the start of the fight with personal and external cooldowns, or they can do brief 1 second taunts right before each bloat. You can also have DPS DKs, Warriors, or Rets pop defensives and taunt for 1 second to take one, or you can bop them and have them taunt for 1 second. If you're 2 tanking, it's important to remove your threat modifiers such as Defensive Stance, Righteous Fury, and Frost Presence once the other tank taunts off of you. If you're DPSing faster go with a plus 90% damage buff and you have your threat modifier on still, you'll rip off the new tank very easily. Faster go will also cast Inhale Blight every 30 seconds, at which point you will gain a stacking plus 30% damage and attack speed buff and reduce the pulsing shadow damage in the room. You will cast Inhale Blight three times for a total of plus 90% damage and attack speed. You'll definitely want defensive CDs while he has three stacks, and you may need to use some at two stacks as well. 30 seconds after Fessiga reaches three stacks of Inhale Blight, he'll cast Pungent Blight, an AoE on the whole raid that deals about 65k damage on 10 man and 75k on 25 man. Throughout the fight, players will randomly be selected for a spore, which will be an orange spiky ball above their head. After 12 seconds, the spore will explode and deal a small amount of damage to nearby players, but will give them a stacking debuff that reduces damage of Pungent Blight by 25% per stack. So it's important to make sure everyone in the raid gets hit by this debuff each time spores come out so they don't die to Pungent Blight later on. 
Since it's random who gets the spore, you can run into situations where all of the spores are on range or all of them are on melee. If you're currently tanking and a spore spawns on you, just make sure you inch into the boss close enough to spread it to the melee, and they should also do the same thing. If range are lacking a spore and you have one while you're off tanking, you should always run out to range and allow melee DPS with a spore to stay on faster gut. On heroic, Putricide will also throw oozes at you from the upper balcony. There will be a small green puddle on the ground where it's going to land and explode. Just make sure you move about 10 yards away from any puddles. It doesn't matter if the ooze passes through you, it will only do damage around its point of impact. Anyone who gets hit by this will also get a huge hasty buff. If a healer gets hit by one, you'll likely need to use a defensive. Next we've got Rot Phase. He'll be down the right side of the hallway in the Plague Wing. This fight only requires one tank on both 10 and 25 man. The Ooze Kiter can either be a DPS or another tank. If neither tank has a DPS bag, just two tank it and have one of the tanks on oozes the entire fight. However, if one of the tanks has a DPS bag, it's best to have a hunter kite the oozes because they can still do solid damage to the boss while also handling oozes, whereas a tank on the oozes won't do any boss damage at all. Since you might be assigned to handle oozes, let's go over that. A random player will periodically get mutated infection, a cleansable disease that deals damage every second and applies a big healing debuff. Once this is cleansed, a small ooze will spawn and have 500k threat on that player. The little ooze will do pulsing AoE damage to nearby players, so it's best if players with mutated infection get away from people before they get cleansed. Once you've spawned a second ooze, you can combine two small oozes into a big ooze by simply getting them near one another. This will be the job of the players they spawned on. Once a big ooze has been created, it will have a normal threat table. Just thread it and start guiding. Generally, you'll just guide it in a circle around the room. Slime will fill a section of the outside ring of the room randomly. This will slow anyone inside of it and deal some damage, but you can just get a hand of freedom and run right through it. You can also turn around and avoid the slime if it spawns in front of you if you wish. Any future oozes that spawn, your fellow raid members will be guiding into your big ooze. Let them know they should try to meet you along your kite path, not just try to chase you down. The big ooze will do a higher damage pulsing AoE around it, so try not to guide it through people. Each ooze that gets absorbed into the big ooze will give the big ooze a stack of unstable ooze, which increases its damage by 20% per stack, and this will cause the ooze to explode at 5 stacks. When this explodes, it rains down oozes from the sky on positions players were standing when it exploded. Everyone just needs to move away from spots that they or other players were previously in. The ooze kiter should call out when this is happening so the raid can move. As a main tank on this fight, you're not really going to do anything. You're just standing in the middle and only moving briefly when ooze eruption happens and then repositioning to the middle. Keep an eye on the ooze stack so it doesn't catch you by surprise. Rotface will also occasionally do a slime spray in a random direction that just does some brief damage in a cone. You can look to Divine Sacrifice for this if you're a prop value and it's going to hit a lot of people. Now for Professor Putricide. The entrance to his room will be in the middle of the hallway. Before you enter his room, there's a short event where he locks you in a room and bugs attack you. This event is more of a time waster than anything. Just kill the bugs and wait for the door to open. For Putricide, you can use 1-2 to two tanks on 10-man and 2-3 to three tanks on 25-man. Once raids are really geared, you can probably solo tank it on 25-man too. As a tank on this fight, you'll have one of two roles. You'll either be tanking Putricide the entirety of Phase 1 and 2 on your own, with tank swaps in Phase 3, or you'll be piloting the Abomination for Phase 1 and 2, and then actually tanking in Phase 3. If you're the A-bomb player, you'll run up to Putricide's lab table immediately and right-click it. This will give you a short debuff, and when it expires, you'll turn into the A-bomb. Once you're an A-bomb, you should call for buffs like Blessing of Might, Kings, and Mark of the Wild. The A-bomb has three abilities. One is Eat Ooze, which will consume slime on the floor, decreasing the size of the slime pool and giving you some energy. Two is Regurgitated Ooze, which costs 45 energy and applies a movement slow and damage over time to an ooze. This is the only way to slow the oozes, and getting this on oozes ASAP when they spawn is your primary focus. It lasts 20 seconds, so generally you won't need to reapply it, but during heroic putricide transitions, you potentially will. Your three is Mutated Slash, which does high instant damage and applies the same armor debuff as Sunder. 
The A bomb also has a very high damage auto attack, but you need to right click Putricide or an ooze to activate it. The A bomb can also die, so it needs to be healed. And the A bomb debuff is a disease, so tell your raid not to cleanse this on accident or you'll just get kicked out of it. For wipes, someone should cleanse you though, so you can die quicker and get the wipe to happen faster. So the way you play A bomb looks like this. Make sure your auto attack is activated at all times. Stand in slime and putricide should be positioned by the main tank just outside of it so you can spam your one and three at the same time. This will allow you to do huge damage while also reducing slime puddle size and building up energy. If putricide is tanked in good spots for you the entire fight, you can potentially be the number one overall damage. The first two slime puddles that spawn you generally don't want to immediately remove. Eat them a bit to gain energy, but leave them up as an infinite source of energy. We have everyone start the fight near the green ooze wall so that these are spawned off to the side where they don't really impact anything we're trying to do. It's totally fine if these initial slime pools never get removed and sit there the entire fight. Slime pools have a capped size, so focus on newly spawned slime pools that you can remove quickly. Once an ooze spawns, use regurgitated ooze on it, your 2 button. You should also auto attack it and spam 3 to get it down quickly. Green oozes in particular, the A-bomb has a huge advantage in DPSing because it cannot get chosen by the ooze or knocked back. The A-bomb can easily be the difference between the raid getting 1 or even 2 fewer explosions, which we'll talk about later. To summarize, eat slime to gain energy, which you'll use to slow the oozes. Try to always be DPSing putricide with auto attack and mutated slash while you're eating slime. Eat new slime pools to clear space for the raid. And cast regurgitated ooze on new oozes at spawn and DPS them down ASAP. If you're doing this fight on Heroic, you'll be dealing with an ability called Unbound Plague throughout the fight. This is a 1 minute debuff that deals 25% compounding damage every second it's on a player. You can pass this to another player by moving close to them, and you'll get a debuff called Plague Sickness that increases your damage taken from Unbound Plague by 250%. Basically the way you handle this is that one person holds onto this for a short time, then passes it on to someone else who doesn't have Plague Sickness. As a tank, you can hold this for a long time with defensive CDs and significantly cut down on the number of people needed for passing. Melee do have to be careful not to accidentally take it off of you though. As a tank, you can even hold it when you have Plague Sickness for a little bit too. In Phase 1, Putricide will occasionally drop slime puddles on random players. These deal damage to anyone standing inside of them. They'll periodically cast unstable experiments, which will summon a green or orange ooze. It will start with green and alternate from there every cast. The green ooze will fixate a random raid member and root them in place. Upon reaching its target, the green ooze will then explode, dealing AoE damage split amongst anyone hit. It's important that you help soak this, and it's best if everyone soaking has their back facing the same direction so you get knocked together. If you're a prop pally, DSAC is great for the explosion. The orange ooze will fixate a random player, but the player will be able to move freely. They just need to kite the ooze because it will deal huge damage to the raid if it reaches them. Once Putricide reaches 80%, a phase transition will happen. You'll want to make sure you don't have an ooze up when you push him to 80%. If you're on normal mode, the whole raid will be stunned for a while on the transition. If you're on heroic, the raid won't be stunned and Putricide will instead summon both a green and orange ooze at the same time. The raid should focus on getting the green ooze down ASAP, and if you're in the A-bomb, you'll want to make sure you have enough energy to slow both oozes going into the transition. Prioritize slowing the orange ooze if you're lacking energy. If you're on heroic and finish killing the oozes early, you can run up to Putricide at his table and start attacking him before he's finished and get some free damage. After a while, Putricide will begin attacking you again and phase 2 will begin. In this phase, he'll do the same things as phase 1, but he'll also cast malleable goo on ranged and drop choking gas bombs in melee every 35 seconds. Keep an eye on malleable goo as you're moving so you don't move right into one. This will deal damage and give a huge hasty buff like on Fester Gut. When the choking gas bomb cooldown is coming up, make sure he'll drop them in a spot that isn't going to hinder the raid. These will give a huge hit debuff and deal damage to anyone near them. When they expire, they'll also do huge AoE damage to anyone in a small area around them. At 35%, Putricide will enter another transition phase, so make sure you don't have any oozes up when you push him. This will be exactly like the first transition phase. He'll stun you on normal and summon two oozes on heroic. 
Once he finishes his RP at the table, he'll transform and the A-bomb player will be kicked out of the A-bomb. Since nobody will be able to eat the slime pools, you'll want to tank Putricide near the wall, and the rest of the rage should try to be as close to the wall as possible. He will still cast Malleable Goo, so range can't be too close. He'll also cast Choking Gas Bomb, so you're going to do small moves only when either Choking Gas Bomb is cast or a slime drops on melee. We want to be efficient with our space since it will quickly become limited, so only move Putricide if you need to. About every 10 seconds, Putricide will cast Mutated Plague on the main tank, which is a stacking debuff that does pulsing raid damage, and each stack compounds the damage by 25%. For this reason, we want to spread this evenly amongst the tanks. Typically, you'll do something like this. The main tank will take 2, then the off tank will take 3, and then you guys will swap every 1 after that. It's also possible to have a DPS taunt one with defensives or bop, but if a player dies with mutated plague, they'll heal putricide. So it's really important that any DPS you have try to take one, don't die. I mentioned before you could use a third tank if you really need to also, and this is where they would come into play. They would just be another target to stack mutated plague on to keep the max stacks low. Keep slowly moving around the edge of the room and taunt swapping until the boss dies. Next up, we've got the Blood Prince Council Trash. This first pack, the main ability that matters for you is Lich Slap, cast by the Dark Fallen Advisor. This is an interruptible cast that will knock you back, so try to get interrupts on it and have your back facing a good direction so you don't get thrown out of position. You will also cast a 6 second regular bop and spell bop on other mobs. The rest of the raid will be focusing down the Dark Fallen Archmage in the first pack and then fighting over who gets to click the orb for the big damage buff. The Dark Fallen Noble will cast Interruptible Shadow Bolts and an Interruptible Banish called Chains of Shadow. In the Blood Prince's room, you'll see some new mobs. Dark Fallen Tacticians will occasionally do a long stun on you, which of course is pretty dangerous if you're tanking lots of other things. You can fap to immune this or have one tank on the Tactician and the other on everything else. These packs hit really hard when you're solo tanking them, so be prepared to use defensives. You can also tank the Dark Fallen Commanders away as they buff the other mobs. However, I always just YOLO tank everything with defensives. Dark Fallen Lieutenants will stack a high damage bleed dot on you that caps at 3 stacks. They'll also put a curse on you that causes direct heals cast on you to apply a magic dot. It's important this gets decursed immediately and any stacks of the dot get cleansed too. Next up is Blood Prince Council. For this fight, you'll want 1 to 3 tanks on both 10 and 25 man. Typically, you'll have 1 tank on Taldarum and Valinar, and someone else on Keliseth. The Keliseth tank, however, does not need to be an actual tank. A ranged DPS can also tank him, generally a warlock. If you're having problems with only 1 tank on Taldarum and Valinar, you can have a second tank. I haven't tried it yet, but I'm expecting this fight to be fully solo tanked at some point too. There are a lot of mechanics on this fight, but it's actually a pretty simple fight once you get a handle for things. If you're doing this on Heroic, you'll get a stacking debuff that will deal shadow damage to you when you move, so you'll want to limit movement as much as you can on Heroic. If you're on Kaliseth, you can freely move because you'll have a huge shadow damage reduction. The Princes have a shared health pool, but only one of them will be able to take damage at a time. The attackable Prince will also be empowered, amplifying his abilities. Valinar will start the fight empowered and will cast Shock Vortex on the raid periodically, which will put a debuff on everyone that causes a small AoE damage and knockback around them when it expires. As a tank, you don't really need to worry about this, just stand still. Melee should be moving away from you and spreading to not hit anyone else. When Valinar is not empowered, his Shock Vortex will instead be cast on the ground. This will appear as a small swirly white area, and after a few seconds it will expand, knock back, and deal damage to anyone hit by it. His ground effect will persist for a while. Periodically, the Empower will change to a different print. After Valinar, it will be random. We'll talk about Taldarum first. He will occasionally cast a giant flame orb that will fixate a random ranged player. Any player this passes through will take some damage, but reduce the final damage the flame orb will do when it reaches the target. So it's important that the flame orb passes through a lot of people so it won't one-shot its target. To accomplish this, you should be positioned on the stage with your melee on the stairs and range stacked up near the middle of the room. Whoever gets selected for it will then run backwards out of the range stack. This will cause a flame orb spawn to pass through all of the melee and range before it reaches the chosen target. Whoever gets chosen can also use defensives. Immunities are great here. The AoE the Flame Orb does when it reaches its target is not split, so it's important that the target is away from everyone else when it blows up. When not empowered, Taldarum will cast a weak version of Flame Orb that you don't really need to do anything special for. 
It also casts glittering sparks on a random raid member that will apply a cleansable dot and movement speed debuff in a cone. The last prince, Kelaseth, will spam shadow bolts on his tank, and when he's empowered, these do significantly more damage. Around the room you'll see ads called Dark Nuclei floating around. Important for the Kelaseth tank to pick these up because they'll give the tank a stacking, reduced shadow damage taken debuff that allows them to survive Kelaseth's empowerment. The Dark Nuclei do not have normal threat tables, however. They just attack the last person who did damage to them. Some cleaves will bounce to them, such as Hammer of the Righteous, so it's important to be careful using certain cleaves around them so the Kelaseth tank can easily pick them up. As a Kelaseth tank, you'll generally want to tank him a bit away from the Valinar and Taldarum tank to cut down on people ripping your Dark Nuclei off of you. When the raid is DPS and Kelaseth though, people just have to be really careful not to rip Dark Nuclei off of you or they'll get you killed. If you notice you've lost some Dark Nuclei while Kelaseth is empowered, you should pop a defensive immediately, but you should also be running all your defensives while he's empowered anyway. The last mechanic to talk about is Kinetic Bomb. These will be big yellow balls in the air that slowly move toward the floor. They need to be hit before they reach the floor to send them back up into the air. Generally, Hunter and Warlock pets will handle these, but it's good to keep an eye on them as a tank, as a backup. If one of these hits the ground, they'll do AoE damage and knock back the entire raid. It may seem like there's a lot going on on this fight, but it's actually pretty simple once you check it out for yourself. After Blood Council, I recommend going through the door on the right for Lanathel trash. There's identical trash on each side, but you only need to clear one side. And we've found that when you jump through the floor after Lanathel, pets that people forgot to dismiss always seem to go down the right side and will pull that trash. So it's easiest to just clear that side so there aren't any mishaps with pets. This trash is pretty much all the same stuff you've seen before. Now we've got two Blood Queen Lanathel. You'll want one to two tanks for this fight on 10 man, and probably two tanks on 25. If you're solo tanking this, you'll have a Holy Pally as the Blood Mirror Soaker. I haven't tried the Holy Pally Soaker on 25 man, but it might work, especially once people have better gear. You'll tank Lanathel right where she's standing. The Blood Mirror mechanic I mentioned is a debuff, but on the main tank and the closest person to the main tank, which causes them to take 100% of the damage that the main tank receives. This means that anytime you reduce damage on yourself, you also reduce it on the Blood Mirror Soaker, doubling the value. There aren't any mandatory tank swaps on this fight, but you can swap to run defensives. For example, the main tank uses their wall, then when it expires, the off tank taunts and uses their wall, allowing both walls to fully reduce damage on both tanks. Your fellow raid members will occasionally get linked together by Pact of the Dark Fallen and cause a lot of AoE damage to nearby players. This is a good time to use both defensives for yourself or for the raid, since healers will have more to deal with during this time. Random players will also get chosen for Swarming Shadows, which causes them to drop fire on the ground. They should be taking this to the wall out of the way, but if someone drops on melee, you may need to reposition. About every two minutes, Lanathel will fear the raid and fly into the air. You just need to spread out for this, try to be away from others. If you're a prop pally or feral druid, you can look to throw heals on the raid during this time. She'll then come back down after a short time and you'll just keep repeating the same things. There's also a vampire mechanic in this fight that doesn't affect as much as tanks, but I'll go over it quickly. At the start of the fight, the highest threat person that isn't number one total threat and or doesn't have blood mirror will be bitten, causing them to deal 100% more damage and heal for 10% of damage dealt, but they will cause no threat. When this effect expires, a new bar will show up with one ability and they'll have to use that to bite someone else. If they don't, they'll get MC'd. As a tank, you either won't be bitten at all or it will be very late in the fight, so you don't really have to worry about this, but it's good to be aware of. Just be ready to taunt and kill any MC'd players so they don't kill others in your raid. Now we'll head to the Frost Wing. You'll have a bit of trash before the next boss, Philithria. We generally just yellow tank AoE all of these down. Grip the Huntress is in, the Warlords will whirlwind, so try not to tank your red on top of ranged. Battlemenders will spam a stacking bleed on you and buff themselves with Adrenaline Rush for plus 100% attack speed. Use defensives if stacks get high on the bleed, but usually it will fall off before they get too high. The next pull will have a Deathbringer that should be interrupted, or else it will summon a bunch of adds and banish random people. The Frostbringer does AoE damage around it, so melee generally just will let the range handle that. This mob does not need a tank on it. You can pull the next pack for melee while ranged are working on the Frostbringer if you want. At the end of the hallway, you'll fight a mini boss, Sisters Falna, but she doesn't really do much. 
She'll reanimate some of the NPCs from the hallway, so just be prepared to pick them up. Now we're at Volithria Dreamwalker. You'll want 1-2 to two tanks on 10-man and 2-3 to three tanks on 25-man. This is a unique fight because the healers have to heal the dragon in the middle of the room to full HP to end the fight. As a tank, this is purely an ad fight. On 10-man, you'll have ads spawning out of the front two gates, and on 25-man, they'll come out of all four gates. You'll deal with a few different types of ads on this fight. Blistering zombies will deal high melee damage and will explode when they die. Generally, you'll have range focus on these. Try to only go into melee briefly on these, or not at all. The explosion they do when they die will also damage Valithria, so try to make sure they die away from her. Abominations have a frontal cone attack that applies a cleansable debuff. Face them away from other raid members. Shortly after an A-bomb dies, worms will begin spawning out of its corpse, so be prepared to pick these up. They do apply a stacking damage over time though, so if you have good range AoE and slows, you can avoid going in on these at all. A-bombs are also level 83, so be prepared for taunt resist. This isn't a bad fight to have taunt glyph, because you'll be taunting a lot. And you may not always have your second taunt as a backup for a taunt resist. Risen Archmages need to be interrupted. They'll cast an AoE Mana Burn Frostbolt. These Archmages do melee pretty hard too, so you can't just let DPS tank them. Stuns can be used on all of these mobs, so look to make good use of them. Blazing Skeletons are a high priority kill target for your DPS, but not something you need to worry about picking up. If you don't have other things to do, you can help DPS it down, but don't worry about these if you're dealing with other stuff. Suppressors are small geist mobs that will apply a reduced healing debuff to Volithria. They cannot be picked up, but like Blazings, you can help DPS them if you aren't doing other things. That's the whole fight right there, you're just picking up adds the entire time until your healers get Volithria to full. Basically just try to minimize damage to yourself, the raid, and Volithria through good positioning, stuns, and taunts. After Volithria, you'll go down an elevator and do a really tedious event. Once you move into the room, spiders will attack you. Focus on picking up the champions. The web weavers will stand still and shoot scarabs. So either drag champions on top of them or get them gripped in. Some Vrykul will also spawn. Just pick these up and interrupt the casters. The warriors will occasionally throw a sword on the ground that does AoE damage. Just move away from this. You'll have one more wave of big spiders and then the gate to Sindragosa will finally open. In Sindragosa's room, you'll fight a bit more trash. There will be a pack of whelps with a Vrykul on each side. Just have someone bubble pull and AoE all of this down. Once they're dead, two dragon mini bosses will spawn. They have normal dragon mechanics. Spinesarker will fear and Ram Fang will drop patches on the ground that slow and deal damage. They can be pulled separately too. As soon as both of them are dead, Sindragosa will automatically engage, so if you don't want to immediately fight her, you should exit the room so she despawns. If you're on Heroic, you'll want to set it to Normal for this, otherwise you'll lose an attempt doing the reset. Now we're at Sindragosa. You'll want 1-2 to two tanks for this fight on both 10 and 25 man. I recommend 2 tanking it early on, and then you can try solo tanking it once you're more experienced and geared. I recommend 340 plus Frost Res for Heroic, which is the benchmark for resisting a minimum of 30% of every Frost Breath. For Normal, you can kind of do whatever you want. I would at least wear 219 Frost Res for a 20% minimum resist. Some easy Frost Res options are Helm Enchant, Cloak Enchant, Leatherworking Bracer Enchant, Onyxia Helm, Onyxia Rings, Lesser Flask of Resistance, and Crafted BOE Ring, Belt, or Boots. She's also the only boss other than Lady Death Whisper that parry has, so I recommend having Expertise Hardcap, which is 56, or be close to it. If you aren't Expertise Hardcapped, you can also just stop your attacks as breaths are happening if you want to be really safe and have no chance of a parry haste in the burstiest moments. This fight is really long and will consist of going back and forth between air and ground phases until phase 3 when Syndragosa reaches 35% and will then be permanently grounded. In phase 1, Syndragosa has all of the typical dragon abilities, a breath, tail swipe, and cleave, so position her accordingly. Her cleave is on next hit rather than instant, so it isn't as bursty as some other cleaves, but nonetheless she will deal a lot of physical damage on heroic. Her frost breath on 25 man heroic does up to 65k damage, but it can be resisted. It will also slow your attack speed and move speed. 
Hand of Freedom will let you ignore the movement speed slow for its duration. This is a long debuff, but it almost always resets shortly after air phase ends. I've had a couple rare times where it didn't, and I essentially couldn't move at all, so I bubbled the stacks off. Prowers can remove this debuff entirely with Intervene. Chill Frost Breath about every 20 seconds, so watch the timer and you can pop a CD before it goes off. She'll periodically cast Blistering Cold, which is a big AoE around her with a long cast time. Make sure you move out of this. Before she casts it, she'll grip everyone to her, but this is resistible and frequently you won't get pulled in. As soon as she finishes the blister and cold cast, move back in immediately so her positioning doesn't change. As a pally, I always freedom myself for this. For me, eating chill is a stacking debuff you get when you hit Sindragosa with physical attacks. If stacks get too high, you should stop attacking briefly to let it drop. Generally, I'm able to just attack the whole time and let them clear during a blister and cold, but it's RNG, so keep an eye on it. Unchained Magic is an ability you won't have to deal with as the tank, but it has a significant impact on your healers. This debuff causes any spell cast while affected to increase damage taken when the debuff falls off by 2000, which stacks. On Heroic, this will also do AoE damage to anyone around the person. Just be aware when this is on your healers that you're going to be getting a lot less healing and plan accordingly. Periodically, Sendragosa will fly into the air and choose some people for Frost Beacon. A few seconds later, they'll turn into an ice block and anyone near them will take damage and also be turned into a Frost Tomb. Like Saffron and Nax, you'll use these Frost Tombs to get out of line of sight of a Frost Bomb. The big difference here is there are more of them and they'll be in random spots. The Frost Tombs should be slowly DPS down, but they don't have a lot of HP, so you need to be careful you don't accidentally kill them too early. Try to have them all at 15% or lower before the final frost bomb goes off. Once it does, the frost tomb should be killed immediately. The players inside will rapidly die if they are not broken out. Sindragosa will then land again, and you'll keep repeating these two phases until you bring her to 35%. At 35%, phase 3 will begin, and Sindragosa will retain her previous ground phase abilities, but will also cast frost beacon on a random raid member, like in the air phase. She'll also pulse out a stacking increased magic damage taken debuff called Mystic Buffet, which is of course very dangerous for the tanks taking frost breaths. To reset your stacks, you must hide behind a frost tomb. So for this phase, you'll be frequently tank swapping so that each tank can remove their stacks. Ideally, you'll do tank swap shortly before a frost breath so that the new tank will have minimal stacks of Mystic Buffet at the time the breath happens. You're either going to be tanking or resetting your stacks at all times. Be careful not to run into someone who has Frost Beacon as you're tank swapping, or you'll get frozen and that will cause some problems. If you're ever Frost Tomb, just call for the raid to get you out immediately. Look to use cooldowns for every breath, and just keep repeating this taunt swap dance until you win. Finally, we've gotten to the Lich King. This is a really long but fun and rewarding fight as a tank. You'll want two tanks for this on both 10 and 25 man. As far as gear, you'll just want as much effective HP as you possibly can get. You're going to take more damage on this fight than any other fight in the expansion. I recommend you glyph your taunt for this fight as there will be lots of plus 3 level mobs that you'll be taunting throughout the fight, especially if you're an ad tank in phase 1. I'll have a Lich King specific video out in the future going into more detail about this fight. In phase 1 you'll either be on Lich King or on ads. Lich King hits hard, but mechanically is the much simpler job to do. If you're doing this on Heroic, Lich King will occasionally throw a Shadow Trap onto a random raid member. This will be a swirly black ball that will land on the ground. After a few seconds it will expand into a larger black circle and knock back anyone hit by it so far that they'll actually be launched off the platform, so make sure you move away from this. As an ad tank on Lich King, you have a pretty interesting job. You'll pick up Drudge Ghouls and Shambling Horrors. Both of these mobs are stunnable and slowable. The ghouls will just do regular melee attacks, nothing special. The Shambling Horror has a shockwave that deals damage in a 20 yard cone, so it's really important that you don't face this towards anyone or they'll get one shot. They'll also occasionally enrage, increasing their damage by 200%. This can and should be immediately removed with Trank Shot. Rogues can also remove it with Anesthetic Poison. If you're doing this on 10-man Heroic and don't have a Hunter, you may just need to deal with the damage to let the Rogue pump on Lich King to meet the Berserk timer. It's going to be a pretty big loss to have them constantly running over to Anesthetic Shiv off in Rage, and it isn't too hard to survive with CDs, stuns, or kiting. If the Berserk timer won't be an issue for you, just have the Rogue Anesthetic Shiv off the Enrages to be safe. 
When a shambling horror goes below 20%, it will gain Frenzy, which cannot be removed, and increases attack speed by 50% and damage by 100%. Shambling horrors have a ton of HP, so we kill them in a unique way. Lich King will periodically cast Necrotic Plague on a random raid member. This is a damage over time that deals damage every 5 seconds and will one-shot any raid member on its first tick. When this is cleansed or the timer expires, it will jump to a nearby unit, both friendly and hostile. So the person chosen must run over to your adds and get cleansed before they get one shot. This will put the Necrotic Plague onto the adds, and each time it kills a mob or the timer expires, it will gain a stack, increasing its damage and bounce to another nearby unit. If Necrotic Plague is cleansed, it will lose one stack if it has multiple. So essentially what we're trying to do is to get Necrotic Plague to hop around the ghouls and eventually get a big stack onto a Shambling Horror to kill it. I recommend adding Necrotic Plague to your plater so you can easily see what mob it's on and how many stacks it has. Each time the Necrotic Plague jumps, Lich King will gain a 2% stacking damage buff until the end of the phase. So the Lich King tank will need to be prepared to use defensives toward the end of phase 1 when the stacks will be the highest. Depending on your raid skill time, you will likely get 2-3 to three Shambling Horrors in Phase 1. The Necrotic Plague takes time to ramp up, so there will be an overlap where you're tanking the first 2 Shambling Horrors at once for a brief time. Try to have a defensive of some sort up the entire time you're tanking too, especially if they enrage or frenzy. This will be the most dangerous part of Phase 1 for you, and you won't need defensives again for a while. Remember to utilize slows and stuns here as well. Prop Valleys can use Seal of Justice for some extra stuns that are on a different DR than Holy Wrath and Hodge. Once the second Shambling Horror has spawned, I've found it best to stop picking up ghouls until one of the Shambling Horrors has died. This just ensures that the Necrotic Plague will pass to a Shambling Horror as quickly as possible to get one of them down. Once one of the Shambling Horrors has died, you've gotten through the most dangerous part as the Ad Tank. It's alright if a few ghouls are on some of the plate DPS or the LK tank for a little bit until you can get your first shambling horror kill. Just make sure you're grabbing ghouls on lower armor players. I also recommend having someone apply Imp Curse of Weakness or Demo Shout to your shambling horrors if you're a prop ally or blood DK. Vindication from prop ally will not reliably have 100% uptime when you have two shambling horrors up. You'll also want to make sure Shambling Horrors have a 13% increased spell damage taken debuff so they take more damage from Necrotic Plague. This can be from a Lock, Boomy, or Unholy DK. If you're going to get a third Shambling Horror, it's important to make sure your Necrotic Plague stacks are maintained so you can kill it quickly. If you lose your stack, it will just be a wipe. At times, Necrotic Plague may jump to you, so be prepared to cleanse yourself if you're a prop pally or call for one if you aren't but make sure there's a mob nearby to drop it onto if you still have an upcoming Shambling Horror to kill. You need to be ridiculously close to a mob to be sure Necrotic will bounce to them. I've had it fail to jump when I was only a few yards from a mob. Once Lich King is close to 70%, the ridge should be near the outside ring. At 70%, he will enter a transition phase and deal huge AoE damage to anyone in the inner ring. If you're the ad tank, keep your remaining mobs away from the raid and let Necrotic finish them off. Once you're down to the final tick of Necrotic on your last mob, you can stun or slow it and run away to let the debuff disappear. If it jumps to you, just get it cleansed away from people to make it go away. A Raging Spirit will periodically spawn on a random player throughout this transition phase. These need to be picked up immediately and faced away from the raid. It's best to tank them facing the center. They'll frequently cast Soul Shriek, which is a cone attack that does a lot of damage and puts a cleansable silence debuff on any one hit. The Phase 1 Lich King tank should pick up the first Raging Spirit since the Ad tank will likely still be finishing up the Phase 1 adds. The second Raging Spirit can be picked up by either tank, but the final Raging Spirit should be picked up by whichever tank will not be starting on Lich King in Phase 2. There will also be Ice Spheres moving from the middle towards players. These will do an AoE knockback that will launch you off the platform if it hits you. Range should be taking care of these, but you'll want to pay attention to these as you're running back into the middle after the transition. Once the timer for the transition phase has expired, be prepared to jump into the center of the platform quickly because the outer ring will disappear. Pick up Lich King if that's your assignment, or drag the Raging Spirit next to Lich King if you're assigned to do that. Just be really careful not to soul shriek anyone while you're moving, and they need to be careful not to move in front of you too. In this phase, Lich King will begin using his big tank buster, Soul Reaper. He'll cast this about every 30 seconds, and it will deal a big but resistible shadow damage hit to the tank and apply a debuff to them that causes them to take 50-70k to 70K unresistible shadow damage. 
depending on the difficulty, when the debuff expires 5 seconds later. When this debuff expires, Lich King will also gain 100% attack speed for 5 seconds. There are several ways to handle this, but a common one is to do a tank swap when a tank gets hit with Soul Reaper. This way you'll have one tank taking the big shadow damage hit, while the other tank will deal with the hasted melee swings. You'll want to use defensives when you're tanking the hasted melees. The Soul Reaper secondary damage is survivable without cooldowns depending on your class and how much HP you have. Keep in mind every little random damage reduction you have will reduce its damage. So for example, Hero Glitch King 25 man will deal 70k base damage, but prop eyes will take 54.5k from it without any CDs due to all our random damage reductions before even factoring in Ardent Defender damage reduction. It's great if you can get a shield from your Disc Priest too for this to have even more leeway. Lich King will also cast Defile on a random player occasionally. This person needs to rocket boot away from people ASAP. A few seconds after being chosen, they will drop a black puddle on the ground that deals damage to anyone that steps in it and also increases in size when people take damage from it. If a bunch of people get hit by it, it can pretty quickly get out of control and cover most or all of the platform. As a tank, make sure to position Lich King away from Defiles. You will also periodically summon Valkyr, 1 on 10 man and 3 on 25 man. It's important that people are close to the center because the Valkyr will fly off the platform and drop the person to their death if it isn't killed in time. Being near the middle just gives DPS more time to kill it. People should also be in the same general area on 25 man so all three Valks fly together and get cleaved. Some classes such as Locks, Combat Rogues, and Hunters have ways to get back to the platform after getting dropped and their Valks can be ignored. These are also stunnable and slowable to a cap of 50%. Improved Hammer of Justice is great for prop allies because it will allow you to hodge every single time they spawn. Prop allies can also swap to Seal of Justice and proc random stuns that are actually super reliable and won't DR with other stuns. On Heroic, the Valks only need to be brought to 50% to drop the player, then they'll fly up into the center and attack the raid. They're just ignored at this point. If you're tanking Lich King at the time of a Valk spawn, just drag him with the Valks for cleave. On Heroic, the Berserk timer will be a huge concern. So to summarize this phase, Taunt Swap for Soul Reaper and the tank taking the Hasted Melees needs to have a defensive. Move away from the raid to somewhere out of the way if you get to file. Assist with Valkyries by stunning and or slowing, and drag Lich King with the Valks for cleave. At 40% the next transition phase will happen. Make sure you're close to the edge as the outer ring will reappear for you to jump onto. This will be the same as the first one except you'll get an extra Raging Spirit this time. Once again, be prepared to jump back to the center as the transition is ending because the outer ring will collapse. If you're on Heroic, your whole raid will be transported into the Frostmourne room almost immediately when Phase 3 begins. In this room, your raid will mark and follow a pre-designated person around the room. Your range will be killing ghosts in the air that will drop bombs on the ground that everyone needs to avoid. It's best to do this part with a top-down view so you don't run into one. After a while, you'll be transported back out and fight Lich King again. You'll likely have one or two Raging Spirits alive still, so these need to be killed immediately. Whoever is tanking them should have them near Lich King for cleave, but be mindful of the Soul Shriek. If you're doing this on normal, one person will get transported to a different Frostmourne room than the heroic one. If you get chosen, there will be a friendly and hostile NPC fighting. You just need to keep the friendly one alive. If a player inside the Frostmourne room on either difficulty dies, Lich King will become enraged for a short time. You'll need to pop defensives or just straight up rocket boot kite him if this happens. This phase will keep Lich King near the edge of the platform and then move him to the opposite side when he summons Vile Spirits. These will move towards the raid and explode on any player that touches them. They start with a small amount of threat on random players, but can be taunted and you can out-threat the base threat. You want to either have someone soak these or AoE them down. As a tank, you'll often be called to soak these, so be prepared to use a defensive. You also don't need to do them all at once. You can do a few, then wait for heals, do a few more, etc. These should be slowed and they can be stunned. Valleys of any type are great for soaking these with Divine Shield. Lich King will continue to use Soul Reaper and Defile in this phase. If you run into the Berserk Timer, he will be tauntable, so be prepared to make some plays with Rocket Boots and Taunt Ping Ponging. The fight will end when Lich King reaches 10.5%. Alright, that should be everything you need to know for ICC. If you like what I do and want to support me, an easy way to do that is to like, comment, and subscribe. I also stream on Twitch most days at twitch.tv slash subtlefw. I'd love to see you guys stop by and tell me how ICC is going for you, and I'm always happy to answer any questions you may have.
I really appreciate all of the support. Good luck in ICC, and I'll see you in the next one.